sure of the date. Brown versus Board of Education, 1954. Anyone else? Three people do this. Peter. Uh, the Lincoln Memorial dedication. I forget the year, but uh, yeah. right, right back there towards the uh, yeah, twenties, early twenties. Yeah. Yep. And um, yes. Oh, Lewis, about that word genius. <laughs> <laughs> I suggest you think survivor. <laughs> Genius, it's just like genius to live 100 years. Like, that's just doing that alone is to be considered pretty genius. So, and all the things that happen to you during your life, and don't knock yourself too short there. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Oh, okay, yeah, so the thing for me that stood out was MTV, obviously. <laughs> 1981. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was you're, pretty, pretty huge. Graham, you're a big fan of MTV. <laughs> um, okay, so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about Graham's life. Do you know the photos you want, Graham? Yeah, I got it. All right. Okay, you guys, <laughs> okay, you guys can put those back. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.
I'm 68 years old. So, not a kid, and this is the 21st century. The first time I sat down with Graham Alvord, we talked about his youth, spending summers in Kittery Point, swimming, doing things that boys did then. He even watched the trolley go by every day. Imagine a trolley in Kittery Point. It actually tipped over once on the curve near the Congregational Church. He tells a wonderful story about that. Now, I know the trolley ceased operation a long time ago, and sitting opposite this bright-eyed, vibrant man with a quick smile and flawless memory, I was confused. You remember this? I was six, he replied. Then it hit me. He's talking about the early 20th century, the last century. Graham Albert was six years old. My dad wasn't born yet. It was the beginning of a 100-year journey. In 1916, Packard Motor Company introduced the revolutionary twin-six engine. The first blood transfusion was performed. The Red Sox won the World Series with the mighty George Herman Ruth on the mound. Boeing Aviation began building airplanes. For the first time, Americans could talk on the telephone from coast to coast. The war to end all wars was far from over. Radio was an idea. Movies were silent. The Memorial Bridge in Portsmouth was still seven years away, and Graham Gillette Alvord was born. When uh, the President Roosevelt proposed lend leases, things were getting tougher and tougher for the Brits, and France had already given up. We didn't know much about the Russians, and when uh, that piece of legislation it was passed by one vote. And I thought, okay, Hitler cannot expect really any serious help from us, and Hitler's going to go through the rest of Europe, and uh, we'll eventually wake up to the seriousness of it for us, and well, we'd probably uh, be in the war for 15 years. Well, we didn't think of it as a big plus at the time, but uh, we know what happened to push out of the war, was the, the Japanese coming in. That meant that instead of a bare majority of one, all of a sudden the U.S. was practically 100% at war. So instead of this looking like a 15-year operation, it looked more like a 5 or 10. And I went in and, and volunteered. I had become a stenographer, and I was a pretty damn good one. So the result was that when I went into the Navy, they were desperate for people with abilities, language. So uh, pretty soon they sent me to the naval operation down in Puerto Rico. After the course of a certain amount of time, the U.S. was getting ready to create a fleet of vessels, and they were looking for people to man those vessels. The vessels were called LST, which stands for Landing Ship tanks, and they were large. Our crew was 10, and we had two other added to that, and those were medical people, because our ship was fitted out with space to take on the wounded. When we first got to England, my job was executive officer, which meant that I was mostly in charge of directing the ship. The first trip, we were slotted to be one of the first ones over there. There were probably, I don't know, 15 LSTs operating around, but uh, we had the honor of being the number one, and the battle was not going well for us on the first day around Normandy. So although we were originally designed to go in on the afternoon of D-Day, as we were going in, we were flagged to turn around and go back and stay overnight about 10 miles on the shore, and then the next day we were told to go back in. It's hard to uh, be exact about what you remember, but uh, I don't remember a minute's fear. There's something about warfare, especially if you think it's a necessary thing and you get to do the best you can, that you just say, well, my job is to do this, and I know my brother had already died in a battle, so on uh Second trip in, we got through the first one all right. And as that was coming over close to shore, we were following a line of ships 
and the one in front of us maybe a uh, hundred feet away. And I was conning the ship, so I was right there uh, at the conning station, you know. And all of a sudden, the one in front was upside down. Yeah. It hit some kind of uh, mine. So that meant that when we being right behind them, wow, we were real careful going in. And then two days later, when we were coming across the channel, we were hit by a mine and uh, lost a fair number of uh, people, including a crew. I still have a vivid memory of uh, one of our young guys, about 17 or 18, uh, who had been in the cruise quarters when the thing blew up. He was near the cruise quarters, and he ran up to the open deck and jumped into the water. We were struck by the mine uh, halfway across the channel. So we were towed the rest of the way in and discharged our load of equipment. And then we were towed back to England. And after we were patched up, we were towed all the way back to New York City. I left the ship at that point. My youngest son took me to uh, Normandy. There were 22 nations that w took part in the battles of Normandy. And one representative of each of those countries were put in a special place. I was the one for USA. I have been critical about American history. I found I could make a very good case against our taking part in this war, and this war, and this war, and this war. We had a whole string of them in our history. But I couldn't think of one argument against our participation in World War II. I guess there's one thing I'm glad of is that if I had to be in a war, I was in a justifiable war. How do centenarians celebrate a century of living? Graham Alvord does what he's always done. A few minutes on the treadmill. Then the New York Times crossword puzzle. Then family. Lots of family. Food and music. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Then, a brief rest, and the most amazing party where people lined up early to wish Grandma happy birthday. Old friends, dear friends, even people he'd never met. The line didn't end until three hours after the doors were open. Then the speeches and well wishes, a surprise dedication. Privilege to celebrate this man on his 100th birthday. Happy birthday, Graham. Everybody, happy birthday. There are quite a few people here who want to say a few words, uh, including Graham himself, and so I don't want to hold up the proceedings. But Graham, you have given so much to this community and so much to this church. I think I can speak for everyone here when I say, we wouldn't be here if you were just turning 100. We are here because you have spent each of your 100 years giving and serving and exploring the world and giving to us inspiration and adventure, and we thank you. We thank you for everything you've given us. You've given so much to this church that we wanted to at least recognize you in one way that we could. On behalf of the church, Rick uh, also has something that he'd like to present. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'd like to say another couple of words, won't take too much time, but I like to put things in perspective for me. And you think about this man and his life, you've seen the Roaring Twenties, stock market crash of 29, the Great Depression, the New Deal, World War II, executive ulcer on a ship at Normandy, 
the Korean War, the atomic bomb, and a few years after that, he turned 40. <laughs> But I gotta believe that having Gene with you has made the journey a whole lot better. So from my perspective, this is for both of you. You guys are an inspiration to us all. At any rate, the church council got together a, a little while ago and it, a rumor had it that once upon a time you produced plays here in this church, Boy. up on that stage and it became known as the Graham Albert stage, <laughs> but perhaps not officially, or at least it was lost in the probably generations since then. So now we're gonna make it official. We're gonna put a plaque up there. <laughs> you know, we do things official. It says the Graham Albert stage, rededicated 7 September, 2016. So this will be up there. More people waiting to say hello. Then representatives of Maine's government spoke, beginning with Senator Angus King's office. In Maine have sent people specially here for today, so we got to welcome them all up together, and they generally have something to say each of them. Something short. <laughs> he did send a personal note. I have to say, and I spoke to Mr. Alvord. Um, the senator said, "Find out how he did it." How did he get to a hundred? Hi, my name is Rob McCann. I work for Congresswoman Pingree in her office in Portland. Um, it's a real privilege to be here today to celebrate your birthday and to spend it with all of your friends and their family. I just wanted to read a short sentiment from my boss as she wasn't able to be here, but I think like all of our bosses, they're, they're all down in D.C. this week. So, She writes, Dear Graham, I'm so pleased to extend my warmest best wishes as you celebrate your 100th birthday. What a joyous milestone for you, your family, and all of your friends gathered here today. In your lifetime, you have lived through times of war and times of peace. You have faced periods of national prosperity as well as economic uncertainty. And you have seen extraordinary advances in medicine, education, and technology. Maine truly is the way life should be because of citizens like you, Graham. I applaud your contributions not only to the great state of Maine, but to our country during World War II. Your service at Omaha Beach is especially deserving of accommodation and recognition by the, president, uh, by the President of the United States. Thank you again for your service, and happy 100th birthday. Sincerely, Shelley Pingree, Member of Congress. A couple stories really are kind of fun that we found out. I found out my, my father first came this, to this church, which has been so much part of his life, when he was five years old, when there was no, when there was no bridge to Kittery Point, to prepare it. And his grandfather was the minister, John Graham. So this, this has been part of our family for a very long time. Secondly, um, having moved away, as many of my brothers, and I'll point them out in a moment, have done, um, I'm in Texas now, um, Chips in Alaska, um, and, uh, but, but I just became, a, it hit me this week also, that about 100 feet away from us, a wonderful lady named Lillian True grew to be 102 years old, and you know, many of you know her. Now my dad's aiming for that now, and I'm thinking, did I move away from Kerry Point too soon? This is <laughs> I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I'm overwhelmed by all the compliments that have been showered on my head. Uh, not the least bit deserved. You don't know me well enough. But anyhow, uh, I've loved living in Kittery Point. As I say, I came here when I was five years old, and in a sense, it's got better and better <laughs> over the last nine, nine years. God bless you all. Uh, Nothing is worth doing that can be achieved in a lifetime by Reinhold Niebuhr, Bodhisattva on a bike. Ten years passed ago, biking helmet above gray hair, chin strapped firmly in place, Legs and feet pumping, eyes assessing conditions of path and traffic ahead and rear in de de dentist-sized helmet mirror, <laughs> the only aerobic striver smiling on this rolling, winding road, 
our hero wheeled joyfully down a middle course into his ninth decade. <laughs> when Graham was teaching at Portsmouth High School in the 50s, and in my junior year, that was 58, um, I, he put together a, a play for us. I was a part of the play. It was a very small group, and there was no set. It was Thornton Wilder's The Journey, and we had chairs on the stage, and we were supposed to be in a vehicle on a journey. Well, Graham took us to New, uh, Durham, and we won all New Hampshire. He took us to Manchester, was it? We won all New England. I won Best Actress. <laughs> and uh, we were National Thespians. And <laughs> all of this uh, were, were due to his dedication. And then he said we had to bring it here, to this stage. So we brought... Thornton Wilder's The Journey, right, and performed it right on the stage. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> in 59? Yes, 58. Oh, it was 58. Wow. Yeah. So that's uh, a... It's a great memory. Because uh, I was a, the class of 59. If Duncan was a class and the Harold was here. So, that's it. That's how a centenarian celebrates 100 years on this earth. We should all be so lucky. Happy birthday, Graham. I started writing my sonnets in 92 as a continuing thing. I might have written one or two earlier in my life. I wrote various other things off and on during my life. Uh, I even remember sending one to New Yorker to see if they printed it, but they, <laughs> they didn't. And I, I've forgotten now what the damn thing was uh, all about. But something got into me in, uh, at the age of 78, uh, and I not only wrote one, but then I wanted to write another, and then another, and then another. And at the end of three years, I had written 166, and I enjoyed it. And the subjects were all over the place. Things you know, was going on in my own life here, or a neighbor, or a chance experience with somebody. Uh, uh, stuff that grabbed me. I wanted to put it into a for form like that. I am a square of glass in a church window, looking out on centuries of burying ground, looking in on a thousand marryings. The muddy lane is now macadam, the bonnets and swords are gone. Wagons and carriages changed to Stanley steamers and streetcars. Gundalos and clippers once were working vessels, now they're toys. And still my fragile unstained pain stays whole. A crystal Yankee Janus slowly slowly sagging to antique distortions. If only I could blink, I think my vision might stay clearer. My wisdom turns to folly, and the church becomes a proper resting place for one who needs a nurse to clean his face. Why did you choose to write sonnets versus uh, poetry? It's hard for me to know, but I think it had to do with Shakespeare. I've always been a, a Shakespeare uh, lover. Uh, and he wrote a lot of sonnets. Uh, I knew I used to be able to repeat several of them by heart. I can't do that anymore, but uh, I knew them well enough so that uh, they were a big part of my life. So what appealed to you about writing sonnets or writing? Very simply, I got a kick out of it, but I just got a kick out of one, 
and then I did another, and that gave me a, a little uh, push to do more. How long is this going to go on? And it went on for three years. If this is being seen by a high school English class, and a teacher is trying to encourage students to write, as a teacher, what would you say to them? What is it that you got out of it that you would hope others would get out of it? It, got, it gave me a memory of a certain event. There was something in my life that was going on, and uh, it helped me to re remember that. This point was about a dear friend of mine who was uh, probably 40 years older than I. I had known her as the minister's wife when I was growing up, and eventually I kept in touch. Uh, the, her husband died, she lived in one place, I visited her there, then she went to a nursing home, and I visited her there. So she was uh, 90 plus and not in very good condition. Two hours each morning, sometimes three, I need to get me out of bed, so slowly, slowly, shift my bones to the wheelchair, and snail-like roll to wash, arrange my hair, get dressed, proceed to take my cup of tea, and see what the day promises. Lunch or dinner downstairs, a collar perhaps, maybe a letter or two. My scrawl is day labor for writer and reader. I pray by the window, read and memorize Rilke or Hopkins or Herbert. One of the boys may phone. I'm ashamed how much I enjoy being alone. And when death comes, I'll say a cordial welcome. I think I've greeted the fellow with a smile. At 95, I've been waiting a long while. Two and a half thousand miles in Europe. 
on the road not taken, some place where maybe, you know, you made a decision and, and, you know, another decision would have changed your life dramatically. Are there any points in your life like that? Well, I think a big decision I made, the first big one was to stop my college years after the sophomore year. 
I, uh, I went to uh, Harvard. I lived at home and commuted to Harvard and majored in Latin. <laughs> and at the end of two years, I completely lost the work in Latin. <laughs> and I spent two years learning stenography and went back majoring in economics. And I got a master's degree for the whole thing. So, uh, Okay. Um, what was your favorite thing about hiking? About hiking? I think probably the, the two things. The novelty of seeing new things when I could do that. And also just the excitement of seeing things. Yeah, was it? Yes, I did. What's the next challenge you're looking forward to? What am I going to have for lunch? What did you do for work and to make money? What did I do? For work. Uh, well, I was a teacher and a guy in Scotland for 35 years. Boston High School, and then I became a minister, spent 600 Sundays preaching in Polkins, so I enjoyed that work very much. Did anyone know Graham growing up? There were some people that contacted me who knew him from Portsmouth High School. Yeah? There are some people here that knew you from Portsmouth High School, I think. And one person commented how they always saw him riding his bike <laughs> when nobody else was really. <laughs> uh, sorry, I couldn't follow that. that that's all right. <laughs> I'll fill you in. Graham, I don't know whether you followed uh, I, I just you know um, a piece of information for you. A woman from Vermont, Sue Johnston, in terms of the uh, 48, uh, 4,000 footers. Something called the grid, where you do um, the 4,000 footers in a month. She has accomplished 4,000 footers in a month, 12 months consecutive. In one year, she climbed uh, every 4,000 footer, January, February, March. She just completed that this past year. So I, I'm sure you can appreciate that accomplishment. I'm certainly in awe of it. And, uh, Very interesting. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, we're going to do a quick kids photo with Graham. So can we have all the kids come down and stand around Graham and then we're going to call it a day.